that's this. The conversation continues after the verdict in the Von Ellinger rape trial. Even with that guilty verdict, one lawmaker says legislative hands are not quite clean. There's still more work to be done when it comes to the Jane Doe's of the world. It's a bubble we've been waiting to burst. Well, it hasn't. And some aspiring homeowners are tired of waiting too and are now looking for workarounds, including building homes with, well, repurposed materials. Its presence, a mere reminder of the mistakes of the past to make sure they are not repeated. Idaho's Japanese internment camp could be under the threat of encroachment, but not for the reason you might think. You know, we kind of touched on this earlier this week when we talked about the trauma sexual assault survivors go through when they try to hold their attacker accountable. And they go through it twice, once during the initial act of violence and a second time when they have to recount that violence in the courtroom. Well, there was an extra layer of trauma for former state representative Aaron Von Ellinger's accuser. Not only was she doxxed and outed by other lawmakers over the last year, Jane Doe was also forced to testify in his ethics hearing. And she was chased out of the hearing room by Von Ellinger supporters and a local reporter, which is why at least one state senator says things have to change on their end to make this a better process for future survivors to come forward. Joe Paris sat down for a conversation with Senator Melissa Wintrow, who says we need to prioritize survivors. When I saw the verdict, I didn't know quite how to feel. Um, I didn't, I wasn't convinced that there was justice. I wasn't convinced that, you know, I was happy. I mean, this is, it was a sad day. Um, the one thing I did feel was a little bit of relief that the victim's voice was validated. But the biggest thing I thought about is my role as a legislator is the legislature's not off the hook. And that there were plenty of warning signs of his behavior, plenty of conversations. What could we have done, all of us, who witnessed it to confront it and hold him accountable? And I think we, ha we should have expectations for that. Um, and the legislature should be required to have a best practice policy to prevent and deal with harassment in the workplace, period. That is our responsibility. That is our responsibility to each other and the taxpayers. Most notably in the court case last week, uh, Ms. Doe left the stand saying, quote, I can't do this. And it started a community conversation of what can we do to prevent this type of situation, a situation where you have a survivor re-traumatized over and over. And you know, as a lawmaker, you're in a unique position here where you could come up with ideas and say, we could change things. Have you thought about changes that you could be a part of at the state legislature level to prevent what happened to Jane Doe in the future? The average time between report and arrest for a sexual assault, for example, according to one study they did, was about 88 days, almost three months. In that time of the investigation, there is no protection for the person who's been harmed from the person that harmed them if it's a sexual assault. If you have a domestic violence or an intimate partner relationship, you can seek a protection order. But our law does not allow for that if you're not in an intimate relationship. So in this case, Jane Doe could not seek a protection order because of the law. And in the, in the past several months, I've received three phone calls from women who want to get protection orders, and the judges say, well, I can't because the law won't allow me. I bring that up because in 2020, I actually worked very hard with many stakeholders to provide legislation for a civil protection order for sexual assault survivors. I had the support from prosecutors, defense attorneys, law enforcement, advocates, victims, uh, you name it. I couldn't get it out of committee. I want us to go back to that legislation and we need to pass it. If there is one thing we could have done for her and many other uh, survivors of sexual assault, if we really want to help people, is to allow them to get a protection order. And all we have to do is change the law to provide that opportunity. Attention is again being drawn to the House Ethics Committee hearing that involved Jane Doe testifying behind a black curtain about her interaction with Mr. Von Ellinger. The committee was tasked at finding behavior from Mr. Von Ellinger that was unbecoming of a lawmaker. They made it clear they were not there to find a crime. Doe was traumatized in real time as she testified. This is the general public, media, and lawmakers watched on. Doe was then chased through the Capitol after her testimony by select media and members of the public, traumatizing her again. 
this didn't work, something needs to change. Over the last year, have you and your colleagues talked or figured out a way to change how this could happen, make it less traumatic? The thing that we don't do well as a culture and a system is center voices of people being harmed. Now, we talk a good game that we do that, but what does it truly mean to center the voice of somebody who's been victimized? It means that we listen to what their experience is and that we are willing to take action to adjust a system or a behavior based on that information. I do think some of the gaps that exist could be filled and some of those things I think are about creating strict confidentiality process in there, accountability for any member who is acting outside of expectations, um, actually you know making sure that we follow the rules we have. In this case we actually had rules that um, we wouldn't, uh, that would protect a third party from harm. Well, in this case, the victim was a third party, but we still put her in a public venue. We wouldn't have had to do that. We do have a committee, a joint committee, uh, that was supposed to convene last session, but didn't. So I, I will work with my colleagues to encourage, support, make sure we are convening, and really try to create best practice process. Pretty moving, Joe. Uh, she said a lot of things there. Uh, what did you take away from what she told you today? Well, she also explained to me that she thinks there should be an explicit non-fraternization policy at the state house, meaning that it would be written in code, it would be written as expectations for lawmakers that they cannot date and they cannot be inappropriate with uh, subordinates inside the state capitol. One thing that Senator Wintrow was reminding me, Brian, is that they're in a workplace environment. They are lawmakers, but they're in a workplace environment, and Senator Wintrow says she wants to make sure people feel safe there. And when you have the events that happen with Jane Doe, you can argue that it's an isolated incident, but you can also argue that what's preventing it from happening again. And that's the concern from people like Senator Wintrow. How are we going to make real steps to mm -hmm. really make a big difference here? And she mentioned the respectful workplace committee group that didn't even meet this last session. You know, she and other lawmakers have spoken to me that they're frustrated that they should be able to meet and they should be able to draw up some substantial priorities and substantial rules so that this doesn't happen again. Because you can argue this will never happen again. Everyone learned their lesson. Well, it's easy to say that. You don't want to watch it play out and find out that you don't have the processes again. Especially when you saw the signs as it was happening. Maybe focus on stuff like this for legislation instead of like things like CRT and ESG and SEL and all that kind of stuff. Might be a good way to kind of focus this next legislative session. And thank you very much, Joe. You know, the housing crisis in the Treasure Valley just doesn't seem to let up, forcing people to find another place to live. Usually it's something smaller. Sometimes it's something far away outside of the Treasure Valley. The solutions seem slim to none for a lot of people, other than just waiting for this market to crash. But one nonprofit is not ready to wait around any longer. And they're building homes out of storage materials. And the homes, well, they're affordable. Well, for some people. Here's Kati Stepovic. Really quick, this is bathroom number one. This is the kids' bathroom right here. This is Peter Manning. This is a sofa bed, so I can now have guests. A father of two, showing off his new digs. Here is Hudson's room. Not much better than his sister. But his new home, unlike anything he's lived in before. Like space accommodation, um, we found this great bed after we moved in. His 960 square foot home is made out of shipping containers. Right? Three of them. I was in the music business for 30 years and moved to Boise to be a concert promoter, which I did uh, right up until COVID, took, took the wind out of everybody. And I didn't have the ability to wait for the music business to come back. And as he watched the housing market intensify, he thought being a homeowner was a lifetime away. It was the very last home for under 300 available. And I was on the tour with my real estate agent and I got the call like, hey, you know what? Furlough's over, you can't bring it back. And I was like, this, this house tour is over <laughs> now. And then that was, it was like, holy shit, what am I going to be dealing with for the foreseeable future? After hopping around to different apartments and friends' homes, Peter found out about a newly developed housing complex that was shockingly affordable. How do we take this huge surplus of disused or discontinued shipping containers and convert them into housing. 
Well, Leap Housing, a nonprofit organization, did find a way. We don't refer to them necessarily as tiny homes, but it's just, just the right amount of space. The right amount of space and price for a certain audience. We really target 80% of area and median income as our audience. So think like one third of all households in Boise are 80% or below. And so this is the audience that roughly can afford about $300,000 in a home purchase. So with median home prices at 575, the market really has just essentially left this audience behind. The homes include two bathrooms and four rooms all in one. The last four homes each sold for $275,000. The first four sold for $212,000 each. We're starting to see upward movement, not only in increased material costs, but also fuel surcharges. Uh, I mean, inflation is definitely playing a role in there as well. And so, yeah, I mean, it, it's all bundled in sort of upward movement of the total cost in order to construct. He's a sweetheart. Despite the higher cost, Peter calls himself lucky to have been their first buyer. Well, for both of my kids, just the quality of life that it provides is, you know, basic. They have a bedroom. You know, they have a place they can call home. While Peter and his two kids. You got to pack a lot of stuff into a house this big. May have moved into tighter quarters. Because every square foot counts. He's grateful to have four walls. This is exactly pretty much how I wanted the room. And a roof over his head. When I think about any challenges of living in a smaller space, I think about the challenges of having no space. Yeah, it is a good thought right there. And if you are a one household person and you make over 42,000, you can live in homes like Peter's. It of course increases slightly by household size. Now residents at Leap at Leap's homes do not pay more than 30% of their income on rents. Just last night, the city of Boise announced a partnership with Leap on a tiny homes pilot project. Now this would place people in six tiny homes. The pilot is intended to help in the process of legalizing tiny homes. Currently, Boise City Code does not allow for movable tiny homes. The city of Boise is studying them to see if they could provide legal permanent status. Now people interested in this pilot program, of course, can visit our website ktvb.com right i know because these tiny homes were kind of all the rage for a little bit they were starting to pick up some steam just kind mm -hmm. of you know downsize everything and now people are being forced to do that not yeah. having to do it because they want to but yeah it's an interesting time thank you very much katia it's one of the most historic and sacred places in the gem state for all the wrong reasons now it's landed on an endangered list for a very interesting reason all right, this is the time where you can join the 208 conversation. We make it really easy to connect with us from really anywhere. Text us or leave us a voicemail at this number, 208-321-5614. You can send in your questions and your comments about today's show or something you'd like us to talk about on another show. Just don't forget to include your name and the hashtag the 208. Oh, and stick around. We could share yours at the end of this show.
80 years ago this week, the first of nearly 13,000 Japanese Americans were sent to the Minidoka internment camp in South Central Idaho. It was one of 10 such camps across the country opened to quote unquote relocate Japanese Americans after the bombing of Pearl Harbor during World War II. Minidoka op operated from 1942 until 1945, at the very end of the war. And for decades, it has stood as a stark reminder, a dark reminder of our dark time in American history. Today, that site was named as one of the most endangered historic places in America by the National Trust for Historic Preservation. Not because of its age or because of encroaching growth, but because of a plan to build one of the largest public lands wind farms in the country. The Lava Ridge Wind Project, which was first announced in March of 2020 by LS Power, would be built on 73,000 acres of BLM land next to the site. And it would bring 400 wind turbines within two miles of the Minidoka Visitor Center, some of which would be completely visible from the site because, well, the area is so flat out there and because some of those turbines are so tall, like 740 feet, which is about 135 feet taller than the Seattle Space Needle, if you can imagine that. Survivors of the camp, as well as the site's executive director, say the wind farm footprint would trample on the history of the area. One thing we want to preserve about Minidoka National Historic Site is the immersive experience so people can really understand what it was like for those 113,000 Japanese Americans who were unjustly incarcerated, what it felt for them to be dropped in the middle of nowhere, and what it felt like for them to be incarcerated there for um, for several years. To us who live there, it's it's a sacred site, and and wind turbines need to be far, far, far away. Otherwise, you don't get the feeling that you are a prisoner of the U.S. government unless you see that it was a prison. We had one room in barracks 15, building 8, room E. It's an address that is really tattooed in my memory. So 15 AD is something that even now when I'm 86 years old, I can still remember it. And one of the closest approaching wind towers is right within yards of 158E. And I'm just appalled that someone would desecrate my home, my one room uh, in a barracks in Minidoka with a wind tower. It's just unacceptable. Well, as for the energy company's point of view, they believe the area is a great spot for a wind facility. It's often windy and it's close to existing power grid connections. But even they are aware of the historical significance of the area. I do feel that there's a pathway forward for both of them to coexist. I think, honestly, there, there's a tendency here that um, there's an assumption that just because this is uh, proposed in the vicinity, that it's going to automatically have an impact. It would be good to know and to understand that the Bureau of Land Management is conducting a very thorough analysis and that analysis includes multiple alternatives. So Luke says he's confident they will find a solution to this. In the meantime, BLM says they're still assessing the proposal. Last fall, they opened up public comment and received more than 1,400 messages. Some good, some bad, as you can imagine. But we will not know their decision until this fall.
a long time ago, if you can imagine John Williams' orchestra right about now, about 23 years ago, though, to be exact, the Star Wars saga returned to the big screen, 16 years after the release of Return of the Jedi. That would have been episode six. But in 1999, they were going back to the beginning with episode one, The Phantom Menace. It was due to hit theaters on May 19th of that year. But two weeks before that, they were about to unleash what really makes money in the movie business, the action figure toys. On May 2nd, 1999, employees at Boise's Toys R Us were clearing off some shelves to make room for the new Star Wars action figures and toys, a whole bunch of them. They weren't allowed to sell them, though, until May 3rd, as you can see on the box there, but they had boxes and boxes of these toys in the back, unopened. The workers hadn't even seen what they looked like yet, but they had to stock these shelves before midnight because that's when they would open their doors to the most stalwart of Star Wars fans. A couple hundred of them lined up outside Toys R Us, waiting to be the first to get their hands on a Jar Jar Binks or a young Obi-Wan Kenobi doll. Well, it's a toy, actually, not really a doll. We'll talk about that later. Anyway, on this Star Wars Day, we're taking you back to that Toys R Us on May 3rd, 1999, for a May the 4th be with you 208 redial. Waited 16 years to buy new Star Wars action figures. Can't wait. Outside, true Star Wars fans stood patiently in the rain. I am a known Star Wars freak. Thank you very much. Inside, employees prepared to unveil the new Phantom Menace toy line. We are within a minute of opening. I've been collecting since 79. I mean, I've heard rumors, and it all just sounds so cool that can't wait to actually get in there and see them. All right, looks really, really good, guys. May the force be with us tonight. Okay, you guys got Get out of the way Everybody first. walk, no running. <laughs> yeah, no running. All right. At exactly 12.01, a couple hundred people poured into the toy store. Whoa. Eric, excuse me. You think Beanie Babies are on sale here or something? <laughs> I traded two Darth Mauls for a Jar Jar. Hey, Lynn, do you want one of these? Anybody need a 3 po I scarred. Star Wars crazed customers swarmed sure. the display, slowly working their way closer to the toys. No toy store should be this crowded at midnight. Seven bucks a piece. This group had a master plan. We just each went for different characters and just picked up some and said, we'll sort out the good ones later. Here's some more of the dark. After a careful inspection and meticulous organization, it's time to see the damage. It's our hobby and uh, whatever we can afford. Many spent a little more than that. No comment. I'm serious. My mom would kill me. I'll reach in and grab one. Satisfied they made a clean sweep, the overnight vigil is over. <laughs> I got everything I wanted. <laughs> Unbelievable. That was Jennifer Davis reporting, by the way. And I believe Gary Salzman shot that story. You know, it took those shoppers about 30 minutes to clear those shelves of the Phantom Menace merch. A whole half a semi-truck load just gone like that. So if you watch that, I'm hoping there are still a few of you out there. Maybe you recognize yourself or someone else in that 23-year-old video. We want to know what happened to your toys, so let us know.
All right, final minute of the show. Let's get to your texts you sent in during today's show, like this question from Rob. Why wasn't Jane Doe afforded the opportunity for a restraining order instead of a protection order? I'm not a lawyer, Rob, but I did some little research during the show here. I believe there's not really much difference between a restraining order and protective order in Idaho. And as you heard Senator Wintrow say, there has to be a relationship there. So if there isn't one, well, it's hard to get one of those, I guess, issued by a judge. You people will do anything to avoid the most cost-effective solution to the housing crunch. $200,000 plus for a shipping container. A manufactured home park based on an occupant co-op ownership model would provide housing at one-third of the shipping container costs. Some ideas out there. Everyone wants green energy, so this is the cost of having clean, renewable energy. Sad but true, says Jim in Boise. And this is regards to the wind farm proposal that's supposed to be outside the Minidoka internment camp. Still waiting to see what happens this fall, but we've been to the Minidoka. One of the most impactful things about it is the vast isolation Japanese Americans dealt with while being incarcerated. Let's keep it that way. It's an important lesson for Idahoans and Americans to see. We'll see you tomorrow.